Let's move to our first resolution. And it is the three word protest cry that's been heard around the nation, defund the police. And those three words actually comprise our first uh, resolution. Kicking off this first round for his 90 second opening statement on the resolution, Paul Butler, on the statement, we should defund the police. Do you say yes or no? Yes, we should reallocate the billions of dollars that tax is currently spent on policing to programs that are proven to keep communities safer and citizens healthier. Nine out of 10 calls the police get are for nonviolent encounters, often have people with guns and clubs and the power to arrest, make things worse, not better. People call the police because of a problem in a relationship or a beef between neighbors or because of a mental health crisis or someone who is suffering from addiction or homelessness. The guns, the pepper spray, the batons, the handcuffs, they don't solve the problem. There are a lot of myths about police, including that they solve crimes. The police don't solve the vast majority of crimes. People know that if you call 911 and say your iPhone is stolen, the cops aren't going to find your iPhone. What a lot of people don't realize is that's true for most crimes. 70%, 70% of robberies, 70% of rapes are not solved by the police. 40% of murders aren't solved. One consistent finding in social science is if we want to reduce crime, education equity, and establishing jobs is the best approach. So defund the police recognizes that shifting resources to community programs for violence prevention or mental health treatment and providing housing to homeless people is a better use of resources than the billions of dollars that are now spent on policing. Thank you, Paul Butler. Next to argue yes or no on the resolution, we should defund the police. Jason Johnson. Jason, are you yes or no? I'm a no. You're and a no. There are three, princi three principal reasons. Uh, one is that police are a critical component and an irreplaceable component in the public safety team to provide safety to the, the public at large. We know that when police are marginalized or unable to do their jobs to the full extent that crime tends to go up, uh, this year, for example, homicides nationwide are up almost 15 percent um, in selected jurisdictions like in New York this year. Uh, arrests are down 55 percent and homicides are up 45 percent in Chicago in 2016. After their stop and frisk agreement with the ACLU, arrests went down 24 percent, homicides up 59 percent in Baltimore. After the Freddie Gray riots, arrests down 28 percent, homicides up 55 percent. Clear connection between police activity and violent crime. Uh, reason number two is uh, reform, police reform, which is something people of goodwill on both sides of the issue agree is good to one degree or another. Uh, reform is expensive. It does cost money. It does not come for free. Uh, training police officers to a new standard, whether it's de-escalation or addressing mental health issues or anything else, if we're going to have police officers, we are going to have to change to one degree or another how they operate. Uh, that costs money. Number three is the communities that are most impacted by this proposed defunding don't support it. Gallup poll in June and July of this year uh, found that 81% of African Americans and 83% of Hispanic respondents to a poll uh, did not support reducing the amount of police presence in their communities. Thank you, Jason Johnson. Um, let's move on to our next debater on the question, defund the police. Rafael Mangual, you are up next. Do you say yes or no? and we should defund the police? I say absolutely not. And I say that for the most obvious reason that you can think of something that Jason just touched on, which is that doing so will significantly reduce the capacity of law enforcement to keep crime and disorder at bay in the United States of America. And that is a failure whose consequences will fall disproportionately on black and brown communities throughout the United States, which is something I think we ought to keep in mind because it is in those communities' names uh, that, that we hear that, that call to defund the police uh, exclaimed. Now, America's actually already gotten a taste of what less policing looks like, and it's not pretty. Consider, for example, that Sunday, May 31st, was the single most violent day in the city of Chicago since that city started keeping track in 1961, with 18 murders committed over the span of just 24 hours, nearly all of them on the city's south and west sides. Now, why is this noteworthy? It's noteworthy because May 31st uh, was a day in which 
rather than proceeding with normal weekend deployments um, and patrol activity, Chicago police were overwhelmed by riots um, as a result of the George Floyd incident. Those riots erupted throughout the city, causing police to redeploy their resources away from problem neighborhoods. Um, and we have some support for this in the, uh, in the reporting, right? Um, uh, Father Michael Flager, a noted police critic in the city of Chicago, told the Chicago Sun-Times that particularly that Sunday, he heard people saying all over, quote, hey, there's no police anywhere. Police ain't doing nothing. Now, while that's an extreme example, uh, what that day in Chicago illustrated is a longstanding principle of criminology expressed by the routine activities theory of crime. Police are the most uh, obvious form of capable guardians that we have, and reducing their capacity to do their job will cause significant harm. Thank you very much, uh, Raphael. Our next debater uh, taking on this resolution will be uh, Sue Rar. Sue, um, as I said, you served as sheriff of King County. You have a law enforcement uh, perspective in general. We'd like to hear what you have to say on this resolution. Should we defund the police, yes or no? If defund means to eliminate the police, absolutely, unequivocally, no. If it means reducing or diverting their funding to social services, my answer is not yet. We must learn from the cautionary tale of the deinstitutionalization movement of the 1970s when funding was cut for mental health institutions. The theory was that we should get patients out of the inhumane institutions and they should be treated in their communities. The theory was well-intentioned but not well-implemented because the infrastructure was not in place to deliver services and the money didn't follow the need. To this day, we still don't have an adequate system in place to manage and provide treatment through addiction and mental illness. So it won't work to simply move the money from one system to the other. The reason police respond to calls involving homelessness, drug use, and mental illness is because we're the only ones that answer the phone 24 seven and show up. By the time people call police, the problem is out of control and often too dangerous for an unarmed social worker to, to respond. We are not like the fire service who intentionally took on the role of emergency medical services. We simply inherited the system failures of other institutions. We should not look at this as an either or. To quote one of my heroes, Tucson Police Chief Chris Magnus, you have to get the right problem into the right hands, and then the hands have to work together. And our final debater on this resolution with an opening statement, Vikrant Reddy, on the resolution, defund the police, we should defund the police. Are you yes or no? I'm a no, assuming that we're speaking English and assuming that defund means what any rational English speaker would think it would mean, which is to say that we take the money away and we uh, more or less make the institution extinct. That would be ludicrous. We have human nature. It's a reality. And if you have human nature, you're going to have incidents of violence. That story is as old as Cain and Abel. You're going to have to have law enforcement to handle those kinds of incidents. That can't go away, period. Now, having said that, I have a hunch that a lot of the people who say defund the police actually mean something different with that word. They probably mean something more like transform the police. They probably mean we should think seriously about whether or not law enforcement is the best way to handle things like mental illness or drug addiction or even traffic. Uh, it's not clear to me, just uh, for example, that an armed agent of the state, somebody carrying a gun, is the right person to walk up to you and alert you that you have a busted taillight. That might be doing more harm than good because it's causing uh, the police to be seen as harassers rather than as helpers. So if that's what we mean by defund the police, if it's a transformation, well, then I'm interested in that idea. I think that's worth a, a very serious conversation. But I do wish that the people uh, who are behind this kind of defund language would have a little bit more clarity when communicating with the American people because I think they would actually get a lot more support. Okay, Vikran, thank you for your opening statement and thank all five of you for your opening statement. We have just heard opening arguments on the resolution, we should defund the police. And now we're gonna give our debaters a chance to respond to one another. We have, uh, we have one clear, clearly stated yes. We have three no's and we have from Surar a sort of it depends what we mean by a kind of answer. And, and, I, and I see in the statement so far that there is a sort of seeking clarity, well, what do we mean by defund? And Paul, I'll, I'll go to you because you took this, the, the most unambiguous position of yes, let's defund the police. What, what do you mean by it? And do, do you mean what some of your uh, fellow debaters have suggested? The phrase seems to mean, let's get rid of police departments entirely. Is that what you're uh, actually recommending? Defund the police is a slogan. It's a chant that 
people in the movement for black lives have used to demonstrate our concern with police brutality and violence. As a policy, what defund the police means to me is reallocating the billions of dollars that go into policing into programs that actually are proven to make communities safer. So it doesn't mean that there's not a role for some law enforcement officers, including people with guns, to occasionally respond to especially dangerous situations. All I'm doing is recognizing what even President Trump recognized in his executive order, where he acknowledges the need for first responders who are equipped to deal with the psychological and mental health drama and trauma that is usually the reason that people call the police. So, um, again, uh, just to zero in a, a little bit, um, would you, when you say defund the police by the billions, if, uh, if there's a, a, a theoretical police department operating the way police departments operate today, let's just make the number easy, has $100 billion in funding, would you see most of that going away or a small portion of it going away? Just to give a sense of the proportionality of what you're talking about. You know, I look at what cities like Los Angeles are doing, where it took $100 million away from the LAPD to program for minority communities. San Francisco, Baltimore, PG County, all of those are reallocating large sums of money, doing things like taking police out of schools. My mother was a third grade teacher. She says she doesn't need somebody with a gun and handcuffs and the power to arrest to make kids do right. She knows how to do that. So again, what we're thinking about is getting the people who are the best at dealing with the situation. And that's usually not the men and women with guns and batons and pepper spray and the power to arrest. All right, so so you're talking about, if you're using the example of Los Angeles, 100, uh, 100 uh, billion is, is, is a significant number, really significant number. So let's take, I wanna take that to Rafael. That's a significant number. That is, that is a profound reorganizing of what the police would do. What is your rea reaction to that? My reaction to that is that um, we know just through simple economics what that means, and that means a reduced capacity for police to do what it is that they're doing. It means that they are going to have to uh, triage their decisions, which calls to take in which order. Um, how much to divert away from proactive investigation, right? When we talk about what's proven to work, um, what I'm hearing is, is a, a kind of a sense that we ought to be ignoring the extremely large body of evidence that shows that having uh, more police, better funded police in communities does an incredible amount of good, right? We have several studies. Uh, Alex Tabrick, for example, uh, did a study showing that uh, during high alert uh, terrorism uh, 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 season uh, back in, in, in Washington, D.C., there were floods of cops into public spaces along the National Mall. That created a natural experiment that showed us that the mere presence of those police uh, resulted in statistically significant reductions of crime. Um, you know, if, if we start to divert police resources away, we will in, inhibit their ability to be on foot patrols, to be proactive in their investigations, also to arrive at calls in a, in a timely manner, which we know is actually associated with higher rates of clearance. Yes, it's true that the police do not clear most of their cases. But if we were to uh, reduce their funding and, and if not eliminate it, what that is going to do is just drive that, that lack of clearance rate high. Jason, what your response to what you're hearing so far in the flow of the debate? Yeah, I agree with, uh, with what Raphael just uh, laid out with respect to the amount uh, body of evidence that increased uh, police officers in any public space or really in any part of a city that is challenged with crimes has been shown to reduce crime. And then that's, that's been well documented. And I would just respond to Professor uh, Butler, clearly, as, as many do, have concerns over the prospect of there being issues with police brutality, issues with police professionalism, issues with police conduct of all kinds. And to say that we're going to respond to that by cutting funding to police is a little bit like saying, if we have a, a problem with uh, medical malpractice, that we're going to cut funding to uh, institutions that train medical professionals. I mean, the funding is what law enforcement organizations depend on in order to reform themselves, in order to develop uh, better practices, in order to implement better training, in order to build systems of accountability. These things are not free, and they are actually quite expensive for any agency that's been through uh, a transformative process like that. So I would just say that, I, you know, I certainly agree that there are elements of 
what have become part of police work that are more appropriate for other professionals. No one can disagree with that. But in many cases, you're, you're going to also have the, have law enforcement involved. Some of these situations are dangerous. They may involve mental health issues, but they, they also may involve people who are armed and capable of harming a social worker who's unable to protect themselves. So you still are going to have to have law enforcement involved, even if they're taking a a bit of a subordinate role. I don't think anyone disagrees with that. I think what we did, I think the real disagreement is that, that that is called defunding. It's not defunding. It's actually spending more money um, on law enforcement coupled with these additional social services to address homelessness, addiction, mental illness, domestic violence, traffic, you name it. Okay, Vikrant, I want to bring into the conversation, and, and again, I, I... Well, good, because I actually wanted to jump in and, and make a point about something, John, if you don't mind. Sure. There have been some references to these studies that show that more police means more public safety, and this is true. More police on the streets means more public safety, but these studies also show diminishing marginal returns. So it's not true that if you just keep adding more and more and more police, you get the equivalent amount, more and more and more public safety. It might be true that you could reallocate some of those dollars to different kinds of things, and uh, get more public safety that way. Let me, perhaps that sounds garbled. Let me say this a little bit differently. We know that uh, more incarceration can up to a point produce more public safety, but that too produces diminishing returns. So at a certain point, instead of incarcerating so much on the back end, you would put more police on the streets in the front end. Apply the same kind of logic to police officers. Police officers more and more produce public safety up to a point, beyond a certain point, it makes more sense to allocate funds to things like those sorts of things we've been talking about, drug addiction, mental health, homelessness, all of those things. Paul you know, Butler, I live in a city. Go for it. I live in Washington, D.C., a city that has more police officers per capita than any other big city. Yet D.C. has a higher crime rate than many cities that have significantly fewer officers. Everybody knows that just putting people with guns on the street in uniforms doesn't make communities safer. In fact, to talk about diminishing returns, when you get the level of policing that we have in black and brown communities and the violence and abuse that's associated with it, people don't want to cooperate. It makes people not like really the government because at this point, African-American communities are so over-policed that the police are the government for most young black men. They're the primary manifestation of the state in their lives. And if you talk to those young men, they don't feel that all those cops make them safer. They think that they make them less safe. Raphael? If I could just jump yeah. in here, I would... Um, Raphael, I would Raphael you go, and then I'm going to come to Sue. Go ahead, Raphael. Yeah, I would just reiterate the, uh, the recent Gallup poll that actually looked at specifically Black communities and how they felt about defunding the police and just remind Professor Butler that there was majority... Uh, opposition to that proposal, specifically within the Black community. So I don't think it's right to say um, that those communities view police uh, with uh, that kind of suspicion uh, across the board. There certainly is some of that. I also just want to address a couple of things here. You talked about diminishing returns, and I think that's certainly a possibility. However, I don't think we're anywhere close to there yet. Over the last few years, the United States has actually seen a significant amount of de-staffing and its police forces around the country. Um, the Police Executive Research Forum in 2018 put out a report noting that a plurality of, of responding uh, police departments to a survey that they put out uh, reported difficulties with recruiting and retention. This is a problem that we've been seeing uh, take up again as of late, especially in New York City, where the NYP actually had put a cap on the amount of retirements that could be filed for uh, in a given week. In terms of the per capita policing argument, uh, just because a city has a high uh, per capita rate of police, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are adequately policed, right? You can have the same kind of per capita rate in two different jurisdictions, but one jurisdiction is more geographically sprawling than the other, which means that policing that larger geographical space actually has higher transaction costs, um, such that the, the, the same amount of, of per capita staffing doesn't really matter all that much. And when we talk about whether communities are over-policed, again, there's been some empirical work on this. I would point uh, the panelists to a study done by Aaron Chalpin and Justin McCreary. It asked specifically the question, are U.S. cities under police? And in fact, what they found 
was that the answer was yes. And really what they found was that for every single dollar spent on police, there was a $1.63 return in social benefits. And so- All right, Raphael, let, 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 me, let me break again, because you've made quite a few points, and I want to let your panelists, uh, fellow panelists respond to some of it. And Sue, again, I want to remind people that at the outset of this uh, round of the debate, you were sort of yes or no, depending on the situation. But jump in with that context. Right. Okay, I guess what I would say is it, I don't think that we're going to resolve this argument by looking at statistics. I think we need to look at the, the argument itself. Police are like the emergency room in a medical model. And I think social services are like preventative medicine. And we're talking about should we have one or the other? They have distinctly different functions. And if you shut down the emergency room, you're going to eliminate a critical piece of medical care. You have to have both. We just have to find the right balance between the two. Paul Butler, what well, about- The emergency room is providing bad medicine. It's not actually making communities safer. If you want to talk about Chicago and talk about policing there, well, what about before the police are apparently deployed to solve, to go after all these protesters? What about what's normal policing like in Chicago? Normal policing is like, for a shooting that doesn't result in a homicide, 20% or lower clearance rate. With all these cops, they can't solve for 80% of shootings that don't result in death. There's got to be a better way. And you're right, Sue, the better way is prevention. Working with community programs that prevent violence from happening in the first place, because in places like Chicago, when it happens, the police are going to do very little. But there has to, but there has to be something in the interim. Prevention doesn't happen overnight. It's going to take decades for those kinds of social services to kick in. For all of our systems that that are racist, that are ineffective, those systems aren't going to be corrected overnight. Somebody's got to come in and clean up the mess in between. Jason Johnson, as as we say words, I mean it happens tomorrow. Defund the police, abolition. All of those are gradual processes. Those are goals. It doesn't mean that we take every cop off the street tomorrow. Jason Johnson, as we, as, we, as we round out towards the end of this conversation, I want to give you a, a chance just to comment on what you've heard so far, and then I want to let Vikrant do that, and then we're going to wrap. Jason. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that uh, clearly defunding is, again, it, it's, it's throwing the baby out with bathwater. If there's a problem with policing in America, and I think all of us can agree to, to one extent or another, there are problems that could be fixed or improved upon. The answer to that is not, cut, is not cutting the funding. If you fix the problem, and, and oftentimes the fix is something that actually does cost money. All the efforts at prevention are, are, are good. Uh, certainly no one is opposed to trying to prevent crime. That is the best and most efficient way to address it. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you, you get rid of the emergency room just because you're not satisfied with the quality of service. You fix it. And Vikrant, as you had to wait last to speak in this round, I want to give you the last word. Well, perhaps I'll just say this. It is true that there's been a, a slight uptick in violence ever since a George Floyd's killing. It's also true that there was a slight uptick in violence after Michael Brown's killing in Ferguson. But setting those two brief periods aside, the broad trend for the last several years, really for the last several decades, has been a crime decline. It's important to note that because while there have been unfortunate problems with police recruiting in just the last few years, that doesn't mean that it's resulted in a lot more crime. All right, Vikran, thank you. And all debaters, thank you for your arguments. And that concludes round one of this Intelligence Squared U.S. unresolved debate. We should defund the police.